Um, I'm going to talk to you just about a, a couple of cases. Um, and, and Dennis, I know there was one case you didn't get to mention called Weary versus Kane. I, I didn't get to Weary versus Kane. Which, which, yeah. Can I just quickly on that? The, the reason. It, We're going to end, by the way, at 345 so that everybody can get to the next 4 o'clock thing. Don't worry. And, and Weary will circle back to the, the, the question of, of procedure. You could ask why Weary versus Kane should be a subject of discussion today when it's a summary opinion. That is to say, there was no briefing in the Supreme Court, there was no argument, it's a summary reversal, a per curiam opinion. And um, in a, uh, a Brady case, that is to say that the court said it was a death penalty case uh, coming out of, uh, again, Louisiana. Um, yep. uh, Louisiana, uh, no, I, well, yep. at any rate, uh, Louisiana. Course, Louisiana, that um, the prosecution had not turned over statements of its principal witness which showed that he had a bias, it hadn't turned over medical records which affected the, the credibility of a, um, a, a particular uh, defendant. Uh, a substantial amount of very powerful exculpatory evidence. Um, uh, and the interesting thing is the dissent, because Justice Alito says, okay, I agree, they should have turned it over. Um, but whether we should be dealing with it is something else. And he says, look, this is a fact-bound case. You know, what are we doing taking a fact-bound case? Well, uh, and that's, that's generally an argument against taking a case to the Supreme Court. They don't decide facts uh, uh, as opposed to broad principles of law. But the very fact that they took it says something. And I think what it says is that the United States Supreme Court, and a large majority of it, felt it was needed at this point in time to make a very strong statement affirming the Brady rule. Um, we, the Supreme Court, are going to tell prosecutors that you, you just can't fudge around with this. And they can't do that except in a fact-bound case, because every Brady case is about what information was turned over and what role it could have played um, in, the, in the outcome of the case. So um, I think it's, it, it says something about what the Supreme Court thought about the importance of affirming Brady uh, in, in this era, that uh, uh, the principles can be stated in a sentence, but you've got to, again and again, at least at, at, from time to time, and Kyle's versus Whitley was another case, come back and say, no, we're not going to find this acceptable. But the other thing that I found interesting about it was that Judge Alito complained bitterly that the court had taken this case on a cert grant from a state um, uh, uh, judgment. Well, why did he complain about that? Well, if it's taken on a cert grant, the, the court essentially has de novo power to review what the state court did. He said, why don't we insist, why aren't we insisting on this not coming to the Supreme Court directly, but going down to the bottom uh, and going up federal habeas corpus, 2254? Well, the reason for that is that if you get into federal habeas corpus, there is an enormous presumption that the state court judgment has to be respected. The, the Supreme Court is not allowed to decide whether the state court made a wrong constitutional decision. It is only allowed to decide whether it's the decision of the state court was within reason. Um, there was an opinion maybe 12 years ago where the Fourth Circuit said, well, that's, you, you, we have to decide whether it's in reason. State court judges are reasonable. Therefore, any state court judgment by definition is immune from reversal on federal habeas corpus. That was rejected in the Williams case. I, I tell you that it's about there right now in terms of federal habeas corpus. And if you look in our, our, um, our packet here about, at summary reversals, almost all of them deal with the Supreme Court reversing state courts under EDPA for saying those judgments were reasonable. So whether you are over into 2254 uh, as opposed to direct uh, 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 review, is generally outcome determinative of whether you're going to win or lose your case. And it is sort of an irony that while 2254 is supposed to be the, the last possible um, uh, avenue for relief in extraordinary cases, Judge uh, Scalia, uh, Judge uh, Alito, is urging the court not to accept cases under, uh, under circumstances where they have a greater power to review them. And I think in the um, uh, the Batson case, he again complained 
that this had come up on state habeas corpus as opposed to um, uh, uh, federal collateral review. So that'll, that'll be my segue to a few cases I'm going to tell you about, uh, which have to do with the death penalty. Um, and uh, it's certainly true that the Foster versus Chapman case is a direct uh, appeal from a state court. Actually, uh, the writ of habeas, or the writ of certiorari is directed not to the state Supreme Court, but to the lower court that decided the habeas, because in both Georgia and Louisiana, the state Supreme Court just refuses to review. So if you lose in the state habeas court, uh, they just deny review. So interestingly enough, the writs are going way down to the state trial courts. Um, and I think the court is way more open to that than they were 10 years ago because they don't like the congressionally imposed EDPA barriers to federal habeas corpus. And an interesting law professor's question is, could Congress write an EDPA barrier statute for review of state cases for the Supreme Court? Could they tell the Supreme Court you can't reverse a state criminal conviction unless it reaches the same barrier? They haven't done that yet, and maybe there's no political will. We'll see. The, the topic for discussion uh, at the cocktail party after today's activities will be who will the next justice be and what difference will it make? Uh, we're not doing that today, unless you guys want to ask it in a minute. So there were six cases that the Supreme Court decided that were driven, in my opinion, by the death penalty. You may remember last term, in a case called Glossop, Justice Breyer wrote a very long dissent gathering all of the information we now have about death penalty cases, uh, much of which is generated by the Innocence Projects in the last 20 years and said, I am convinced by new evidence in the last 20 to 30 years that the death penalty is likely, he said, unconstitutional under the Eighth Amendment, and I think we should take a case and reconsider that question because we haven't looked at it since the 1970s uh, when you, there was that brief moment, 1972 to 1976, where the death penalty was off the table uh, constitutionally. Uh, he says, we should do this again in Glossop. Uh, six cases this past term were death penalty cases. Only a couple of them really went off on death penalty grounds, uh, but Weary versus Kane is a death penalty case. Uh, Montgomery versus Louisiana is not a death penalty case, it's a life without parole case, which I call slow death. Um, Williams, the judicial recusal case, was a death penalty case. Um, I think the court is very attuned to cases that raise the death penalty, and if there are other procedural ways to attack, they'll, they'll accept them more readily than they might Otherwise, uh, in the death penalty area, there are three cases I'm going to mention. The Hearst case out of Florida, uh, the Carr case out of Kansas, and then the Foster versus Chapman case out of Georgia. In the Hearst case, the Supreme Court struck down the Florida capital punishment statute uh, because the Florida statute has, for the last 30 years, 40 years, ever since uh, the 1970s when they redid their statute, allowed the judge to decide who gets the death penalty, and the jury's role is purely advisory. That is, the jury hears facts, the jury makes a recommendation, they don't actually have to make factual decisions, just a recommendation, then the judge can override it or accept it. And in the particular case of Hearst, the, the, the jury decided, I think, seven to five to recommend death, and then the judge says, okay, I find the following facts and I affirm a death sentence U.S. Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional. That program is unconstitutional. And they say it's been unconstitutional since we decided Apprendi back in the year 2000, which is 16 years ago. Uh, the iron, and, and by the way, just a couple days ago, Delaware Supreme Court struck down the Delaware statute on grounds that are similar to the Hearst, inciting Hearst. So now you've had it. And, and the, it's still hanging out there whether Alabama's statute is constitutional. Most people think it is not, but it's still out there. The irony of the Hearst case is that from Apprendi until uh, 2016 when they declared unconstitutional, a number of people, over two dozen people, were executed in the state of Florida. In fact, in the fall of 2015, with the Hearst case pending in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, a person came up for execution in Florida. And Justice Breyer wrote a dissent from the denial of the stay of execution saying, we should hold this case for Hearst because the guy's from Florida and we're going to strike that statute down. It was denied, the guy was executed the next day. A couple months later, the Florida statute was struck down. The death penalty is a serious issue for the members of the Supreme Court today, and without Justice Scalia there, it's really up for grabs, because it's right now four to four, I would say, given the Glossop dissent. And in California, of course, some of you uh, may, may know, right, uh, if you're from California, there will be this November two propositions on the ballot 
having to do with the death penalty. One would declare the death penalty uh, illegal. It would revoke, repeal the death penalty statute. The other is called, I can't remember the name of it, but it's like the judicial goodness statute or proposition. It would speed up the death penalty. Interestingly enough, it would require the Supreme Court, California Supreme Court, to appoint lawyers to all pending capital cases within a very short amount of time. So if you're in California and you have never had a death penalty case, watch out, you might get one if that proposition passes. All right, so that's the Hearst case, striking something down on Apprendi grounds. In the Carr case, you have Kansas. Now, for those of you who don't follow the death penalty, the Kansas Supreme Court is in a long-running battle with the people of Kansas. And the, Calif uh, I'm sorry, the Kansas Supreme Court repeatedly strikes down death penalties, even though the legislature is very much in favor of the death penalty and the people of Kansas keep voting uh, you know, for pro-death measures. Uh, they went too far in the Carr case. The Carr case involves the most horrific description of murders I've ever read in a Supreme Court case. Justice Scalia, I believe, wrote Carr. Um, and it was the last opinion he, he, he wrote for the Supreme Court before he died. Um, and the Kansas Supreme Court, in order to reverse it, said that two rules were required by the Eighth Amendment, and the U.S. Supreme Court in the Carr decision says, no, those rules are not required by the Eighth Amendment. They said that the jury has to be informed that mitigating circumstances do not have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And the Supreme Court said, whatever they have to prove mitigation by, um, the U.S. Supreme Court, it's not an Eighth Amendment requirement that they be instructed against a certain burden of proof, and there's a lot of detail about why that might be true. Uh, the Kansas court also said even though the Carr brothers were tried together, they have to be severed for sentencing because some of their evidence at sentencing uh, sort of points to the other one as the, as the more aggravated actor. And the Supreme Court said no, there's no Eighth Amendment severance rule uh, when people are uh, rightfully tried together. Uh, open question, what if they're not? I mean, you, could you just group people for sentencing? Probably not, but if they're tried together, they can be sentenced together. Uh, the most interesting or dramatic, it seems to me, case of the term, uh, other than Utah versus Streif, is Foster versus Chapman. Foster versus Chapman comes out of Georgia. Stephen Bright, a well-known, uh, prominent death penalty litigator for years, he teaches at Yale now, Yale Law School, uh, was, was the lawyer uh, for Foster. Chapman is the warden. Um, the, the jury selection in the particular county where Foster was charged with murder uh, some 30 years ago uh, is, a, is a county where uh, if you ask people, was there a black person on the jury, uh, people will just look at you and say, well, of course not. That's, that's that county. Uh, we, they don't, we don't put blacks on the jury out there. Well, Foster was convicted and got the death penalty in that. Uh, and, he, and there's no doubt, I think, about his guilt for the murder. The question is, should he get the penalty? Um, some 20 years after the penalty was imposed, they finally got discovery of the prosecutor's jury selection file. Some of you are well familiar with these facts. And they discovered that the uh, jury, uh, the potential jury lists had a big uh, well, first, every black juror's name, potential juror, was highlighted in green, right, so that you could see all the black jurors. And then there was also a big capital letter of B next to those jurors. Stephen Bright says that's for people who were colorblind um, so that they would not make a mistake. Uh, there, was a, there was a reference to a particular church. Uh, if the juror went to that church, it said, no, no black churches. Um, there were other... Uh, very clear indicators that race was a focus of the jury selection. In the post-trial proceedings, the prosec two prosecutors both filed affidavits saying and testified, well, they didn't testify at the habeas, saying we have various race-neutral reasons. They gave something like 13 race-neutral reasons, which the Georgia courts accepted. What's dramatic about Foster is based on this evidence that race was the focus, the United States Supreme Court finds that the third prong of Batson is fulfilled. That's the prong that says even after race neutral reasons are given, a judge can find that they are a pretext for race, uh, purposeful race bias or discrimination. This is the first case where the US Supreme Court has ever found that third prong to be satisfied. And, and Justice uh, Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts wrote it. So first of all, the Chief Justice keeps cases that he thinks are important for the most part. 
So he obviously saw this as an important case. Uh, in, in the most genteel Supreme Court sort of terminology you might be familiar with, basically says, we find that the prosecutors lied about their reasons. And it's a very detailed examination of the record. We find that they lied on this, that it's inconsistent on this, that it can't be believed on that. Uh, and so we, we reverse the, uh, the, the finding of Batson, which I think means that Foster is entitled to a new penalty proceeding. I don't think there's any more wriggle room on remand. We'll see. Um, but for those of you who do jury selection and do Batson cases, it's a very strong precedent. The criticism of Foster versus Chapman is that the facts are so extreme that very few cases will ever match them and that it may set, in a sense, too high a bar uh, for future uh, judges to find Batson violations. And, and, and the hope is that the general language of Foster will be more, uh, more, um, more generous in some sense. Um, but, but those six cases, uh, a number of them, all but uh, two, I guess, come out in favor of the death penalty defendant, even though they're not always on Eighth Amendment grounds. So uh, I think the death penalty, the, the next justice selection will be very, very, very important in this area of criminal law as much as any other area, including you know, the right to abortion and things like that. Um, that is all the cases that we had planned to discuss with you today. Um, so I'm happy to take questions from the audience. I'll try to repeat them in case they are recording this. Um, I don't know if the other panelists have things they want to. Well, uh, we had talked about one other interesting case is McDonald. Um, oh, McDonald, the federal yeah, case. Which are, and We were going to let the U.S. Attorney talk about McDonald. Yeah. <laughs> Please, Dennis, you start. I'll chime in. <laughs> if Dennis starts, we may not finish. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, it's, it's a case in which, uh, to simplify something that's much more complex, there was a fairly egregious pattern of gift receiving by the governor of Virginia uh, uh, from a... Uh, a uh, business owner who was obviously attempting to curry as much favor with the government as he could. Um, McDonald was convicted, sentenced to two years in prison, and um, the court goes out of its way to say, uh, we, f we find this conduct egregious and un unacceptable and offensive, um, but the, um, the standards under which McDonald was tried would really um, uh, uh, qualify as a illegal quid pro quo, um, the um, trading of uh, support, favors, and so forth uh, to a, an official who is then essentially doing things that, um, uh, that every public official necessarily has to do. He's got to meet with constituents, he's got to promote business, he's got to pay attention to the people who support him, so forth and so on, and they just found that um, uh, it, it was interesting. They did a very good job um, uh, on the defense part, or maybe it was simultaneous, getting some of the most powerful amicus support you could imagine. Uh, you know, numerous uh, former chiefs of staff of the president saying, Every president has to do things like this. Um, uh, All the former White House counsel for the last 20 years. Right, well, White House <laughs> counsel, and the attorney generals of Virginia, and so forth and so on. And um, uh, it, it is an interesting discussion. Uh, about um, the limits on the notion of uh, uh, whatever opposition one has to big money in politics uh, to, to uh, criminalizing um, what the court feels is, in, in, in essence, a great deal of the democratic process. The interesting result, the court remanded it back and said the convictions have to be reversed at a minimum. If you find the evidence is sufficient to convict under, a, under our standards, it's a new trial. If you don't find, we'll leave to you the question of whether it's sufficient under our standards. If it's not, enter a, a directed verdict of acquittal. Um, uh, but the, uh, the, the, the sort of political de science discussion about the nature of democracy, I think, is the most interesting part of the opinion. Uh, and I agree with Dennis. It, it, I think it's fascinating. It's going to make it a little more challenging for the government uh, to bring these cases. You know, the bringing political corruption cases are, are, are challenging in and of themselves. And right, there's a real thin line between you know uh, doing what politicians are elected to do, which is to set up meetings and make phone calls and introduce people. Um, and I think this court decided that that in and of itself is not an official act. They were instructed so at the district court, um, and.
Um, and the Supreme Court determined that those types of activities in and of themselves do not qualify as an official act, uh, but rather can be evidence of intent, can be evidence of the desire, evidence of a quid pro quo, uh, but standing alone um, are not official acts. So um, I, I, I do think it's going to uh, make the, the, the proof of these cases more difficult for, for the government. I would say that typically the, the government cases often have insiders who can tell you a little bit more about you know, the actor's intent, what he or she shed, said. We may have, there may be recordings that shed better light on the actual quid pro quo. But I do think it's an important decision. It is hailed as a you know, defense of the democratic system uh, and it's been widely criticized for advancing the pay to pay, pay to play scheme. Uh, that is um, often in play in politics. Right, I mean, the cynical view of McDonald is uh, there's no doubt that the governor was taking tens of thousands of dollars. $170,000. Uh, $170,000 from a local businessman who pretty much buddied up to his wife. Um, and, and so some of it was, honey, I can't believe you did that. But, uh, and, and then in return, he was setting up events at the governor's mansion to which this guy was invited with the important government officials who could help his business. Uh, he was making phone calls to people who could authorize money uh, devoted to research for his business, things like that. It's undoubtedly a pay to play scenario. And I think th the interesting question is, could Congress write a statute that would criminalize that sort of thing? Or, or would that run afoul of some fundamental uh, theory of, of democratic government, representative government that we, that we operate on? It's a, as, a, as, as, as the justice has said, it's a tawdry set of facts, uh, but, but he, um, and, and it's also true, uh, and this is a, a little bit of a wrap on the prosecutors. Prosecutors use different standards to, to evaluate these cases. So McDonald, there was some belief that McDonald was targeted uh, for political reasons, and that other officials who do very similar things are not uh, so targeted, and that there was a sort of a selective prosecution problem. That, that really doesn't make it into the opinion, but there was that feeling uh, out there that a lot of people do this, and why pick on McDonald, things like that. All right. I saw a question.